some people are operating off paper, so we'll do what we can do. Hey, everybody. Welcome and thank you uh, for joining us today. I'm Steve Clemens. I'm Washington editor at large of the Atlantic. And here we're here today to talk about. Uh, you know, this could this could go um, very well in terms of being optimistic, or it could be the most depressing uh, session that you attend during uh, Spotlight Health. Uh, and I'll leave that to all our panelists and our speaker here in just a moment to do, and to all of you. This is called a deep dive, and we'll be discussing who is prepared for the next epidemic, and look at you know what are we in terms of uh, our ability today in terms of dealing with. Uh, the pathogens uh, that may hit us down the road. And we've got an extraordinary group of people uh, to discuss that. And as part of a deep dive, we're going to have first a presentation, then we're going to have a talk amongst ourselves, and then we're going to go to all of you. And I've already kind of come out and talked to this whole first, you know, first few rows here. All of you are allowed to ask questions too, but there's no reason why any of you should be quiet. So lots of questions, lots of exchange, and we'll cut up, a, you know, cut in a little bit more time for questions in normal and, and comments. Um, I want to call the stage Tom Frieden, who's really one, uh, I mean, we have a couple of heroes, Ron Klain, other people, uh, uh, um, um, Ann Schuchat and Seth Barkley, I'm, gonna I'm just going to say you're all heroes as well. Uh, but Tom Frieden, who is uh, right now Chief Executive Officer of Resolve to Save Lives, and has today, I think, just launched a website that is talking about how the world uh, is prepared or not, what parts of the world are better prepared uh, for dealing with upcoming pandemics. But of course, he was director of the Center for Div Center for Centers for Disease and Control and Prevention from 2009 to 2017 and helped work during not just Ebola, not just the name brand epidemics, but many other uh, problems that in the country. I'm a great, great fan of Tom Frieden, so I want to say uh, please welcome Tom Frieden to the stage. He's going to give us the beginning to the deep dive of our discussion on being ready for the next epidemic. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much, Steve, and thank you for being here. Uh, I think it's not a depressing story. I think it's an inspiring and optimistic story, but I'm going to leave you, I hope, with a couple of facts I hope you'll remember from this time we have together with a truth and with an action that I want you to take if you can. Uh, Resolve to Save Lives has a focus of helping by partnering with countries around the world to make the world safer from epidemics. And we particularly look at four things that every community needs to be able to do, uh, to develop a tracking system so that when there's a signal, the equivalent of a fire alarm in public health, you know that something unusual is happening. Trained disease detectives who can figure out what's happening and stop it if need be. Effective laboratory networks so when something unusual happens, you can diagnose and find out what it is, and rapid response teams. We're fortunate at Resolve to Save Lives, an initiative of vital strategies, to have wonderful partners in organizations around the world and generous funding from Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This is one of the big snowstorms of Washington, D.C., February 13th, 2014. We had called dozens of countries representatives to come to Washington to launch the global health security agenda, and the city shut down. But we all trudged through the snow anyway and had the launch um, that February committing to working for a world safer from epidemics, committing to helping billions of people live in communities less likely to have a preventable infection or other health threat. Uh, Ironically, the launch, which had been in preparation for about two years, as we had done pilot projects and proof of principle and got everybody on board from the US government around the world, that launch in February of 2014 occurred as Ebola was spreading in Guinea without anybody knowing that it was spreading in Guinea. Ebola was recognized about six weeks later. Uh, the Ebola epidemic was recognized a couple of months after that. And a couple of months after that, Lagos, Nigeria, pictured here, had what was, for me, by far, the most terrifying moment of the Ebola epidemic. On July 21st of 2014, a man from uh, Liberia traveled to Nigeria, to Lagos, was sick, 
taken off the plane, went to a hospital, died from Ebola, uh, pulled out his IV. The doctor who cared for him remembered him bleeding all over her. There were no gloves in the hospital where she had to work. Uh, and over the following few days, fortunately, uh, Nigeria had a laboratory that could diagnose Ebola and did. Unfortunately, Nigeria initially put into place a very inefficient system for managing the cluster. Uh, for several days, nothing that needed to happen happened. No Ebola unit was established. No contacts were identified. No training was done of health workers. No system was built to track patients and people coming and going from the country. Um, fortunately, then, the polio eradication team of Nigeria, the Nigerian doctors and outreach workers who had been trained to address polio were brought in to handle the Ebola outbreak. And with great efficiency and tremendous skill and dedication, they were able to stop the cluster. Uh, they ended up doing uh, more than uh, 20,000 home visits, measuring temperatures, identifying 43 people with suspected Ebola, diagnosing seven, 19 cases, repeating the entire operation when someone moved to a different city, Port Harcourt, and stopping Ebola in Lagos. If that had not have happened, if that hadn't happened, Ebola would have spread throughout Lagos, throughout Nigeria, probably throughout many countries in Africa. Lagos has 10 times as much air traffic as all of West Africa combined and the same population. And Ebola doesn't just kill people by Ebola, it shuts healthcare systems and it closes economies. So we were literally within a few days of a true global catastrophe in Ebola, uh, in uh, Lagos. But that wasn't the end of things in West Africa, because West Africa didn't have systems in place. Entering an Ebola treatment unit at the height of the Monrovia outbreak, um, I saw scenes that I will hope never to see again. I've worked in uh, war zones. I've worked in um, places that have had starvation. I've worked after natural disasters. But I've never seen anything like I saw in Monrovia in uh, Elwa 3. It was a unit uh, that had more than 100 beds, had one doctor. As I walked in, there was a, a young boy, probably about 14, sitting on a rickety old wooden school, uh, school chair, uh, clearly desperately ill. And by his side was some oral rehydration, all he had to possibly keep him from dying. And I just pleaded with him, please drink as much as you can. I went into the, one of the tents that they had there, and there was a woman lying on the ground with braids in her hair, beautiful braided hair. Someone must have spent hours or days, long braided hair. And then I looked more closely, there were flies on her and she was dead. There were 60 corpses in the morgue of that unit. And there weren't enough workers to remove the dead people to add to the corpses in the morgue. And the patients were very upset, understandably, saying, and the doctor I was traveling with explained to get enough people in to safely move the bodies, it takes a long time to suit up. We can't keep up. And we as a world need to make sure that nothing like that ever happens again, because it didn't have to happen. Since that time, the world has made a lot of progress. And here are the two facts I want you to remember from this conversation. The world has made tremendous progress assessing gaps in preventing epidemics but it hasn't made nearly enough progress closing the gaps that have been found. Working with the World Health Organization, the government of Finland, many other countries and partners, a joint external evaluation tool was established for the first time ever, an objective view of how prepared countries are, looking at whether they have demonstrated capacity, limited capacity, or no capacity. We weren't sure that countries would volunteer. But by the end of this year, about 100 countries will have volunteered to go through this process. And they will have identified thousands of life-threatening gaps. This is what it looks like. This 
top chart, which there will be a quiz on after this session, <laughs> shows in each row a country. 76 of these joint external evaluations have been done. And in each column, a capacity, something that a country needs to have. And as you might expect, red is bad and green is good. Uh, and if you just look across rows, you can see some countries are mostly red. And if you look across rows, some capacities are largely red. What we need to do as a world is to step up to preparedness, to go find a specific gap in a specific country that's red or yellow and step it up to the next level. This is an example, analysis of surveillance data, that is disease tracking data. Well, if you've got, you're a one now in this example, you need to get to a two, figure out what are the microbes that are of most risk, how you're tracking them. Assess the data collection, analysis, and interpretation. Track it at the national and subnational level with trained staff. Check the data quality and analyze it at local and national levels. That gets you, that's not easy. That's not easy. Uh, so that brings me to the truth that I want you to remember from this. It isn't that we haven't made good progress as a world because it's an easy thing we're not doing. It's a hard thing that we need to do. So stepping up to preparedness is hard. It's hard for a few reasons. It takes time. It's not in the headlines. People are too busy dealing with today's outbreak to prevent tomorrow's outbreak. And it takes trained staff in countries that may have limited technical capacity, not enough people. But it's been done. This was Sierra Leone at the height of Ebola. Uh, money, people, systems poured in. You don't see a quick move to green. But you see from red to yellow, from yellow to uh, almost green. So it's possible to make progress with dedicated effort. This is that same type of experience from Tanzania, looking over a two-year period. They were able to get from yellow to green in their laboratory work. They were able to make incremental improvements, though not steps up, in the other areas. This is the kind of thing that needs to happen in countries around the world. Now, this is what that slide looks like. Um, and as you may see, it's a little overwhelming. There are a lot of gaps out there. There are a lot of problems. We need to focus attention of the world and of countries on the specific gaps and the specific case, places that need to be closed. Africa is where we have particular concern. And Africa deserves a tremendous amount of credit, the countries of Africa, the leaders, for stepping up and volunteering for these assessments. 85% of the countries in Africa have either undergone a joint external evaluation or volunteered to, and it's underway. But what you see is in those four critical areas of laboratory, surveillance, workforce, and emergency response, not a lot of green. In fact, of the 25 or 30 countries that have gone through this exercise in Africa and the four different areas, less than 10% of them are green, meaning adequate capacity. Uh, that's not because the countries aren't working hard. That's not because there aren't great people there. That's because it takes time. Uh, where you do see greens, they represent sustained investment, dedicated staff. And that's what we need over time in many areas. We need to step up to preparedness. Uh, you can see here that only nine countries that have gone through the JEE, 400 million people, less than 10% of the world's population, is documented to be adequately prepared for an outbreak. Even those countries have more work to do because preparation is a continuous process. You always want to be better prepared today than you were yesterday and better prepared tomorrow than you were today. No country is at the highest level, five in all capacities. 1.5 billion people are in countries that clearly have work to be done and 400 million clearly documented to be not ready. Uh, another 300 million are uh, done, report not, not yet published, another half a billion planned and will be done soon, another four billion not yet planned to be done. So going back to these two basic facts, world has done a great job documenting the problems 
in the world, but not such a great job closing the gaps. And Steve, in answer to your question, is this a depressing talk or an optimistic talk? I think it's optimistic. When this exercise started three years ago, and I kid you not, we went to the World Health Organization and said, what, how do you track whether countries are ready? Because it's a global commitment. It's a treaty, the international health regulations. All countries have signed on to it. They said, well, we use this uh, Excel workbook with all these spreadsheets, and we ask countries to fill it out themselves and send it to us. And we said, oh, that's interesting. Uh, and well, can we see that workbook? Well, we looked at the workbook. It was uninterpretable. And, and we said, well, can we see what countries have said about it? Oh, no, that's confidential. So we had an uninterpretable tool with uh, non-transparent results. And now we have something very different. We have a transparent tool with publicly available results. Modern transport has made the world smaller, bringing people and cultures closer together. But now disease can spread faster than ever, from epidemics like Ebola and influenza to outbreaks like cholera, yellow fever, and measles, our communities are always at risk and the potential damages are staggering, risking the lives of millions of people like you. In the face of this challenge, it's easy to feel overwhelmed. But the good news is, together, we can do something about it. We can find, stop, and prevent future outbreaks. PreventEpidemics.org shows how prepared your country is for the next health threat and gives you the tools you need to be a champion for a better community. Join with others to raise awareness and tell your leaders it's time to act by closing the gaps in epidemic preparedness now. Here's what governments can do to protect you and your community from disease outbreaks. Commit to a comprehensive external readiness assessment. Conduct the assessment, develop a plan to fill preparedness gaps, secure funding to implement the plan, and implement the preparedness plan. In 2005, your leaders made a promise to better protect you from serious disease outbreaks. However, preparedness requires constant vigilance. We can stop the next threat in its tracks by strengthening monitoring systems, upgrading laboratories, and training the disease detectives of tomorrow. Whether it's a petition, led to the editor, or to the government, or social media, your voice can make a difference today. It's not a matter of if there will be another disease threat, it's a matter of when, and you can help make sure your country is better prepared. Don't wait for the next crisis, act today. Today we've launched a website, preventepidemics.org, and Amanda McClelland, who's uh, the Senior Vice President of Resolve and in charge of our epidemics unit, will take you through that. Amanda worked extensively in uh, health emergencies, including for the uh, uh, Red Cross for the past 15 years, and also worked in Ebola. Amanda. Thanks so much, Tom. <clears throat> So, um, as Tom said, my name is Amanda. I'm really excited to be here and to help you uh, go through the website that we've launched uh, just today. I think the, the key thing for this website uh, for me is the idea that we can demystify all of the data and all of those stats that Tom showed you. 5,000 gaps identified, 51 indicators in the JE. And we need to do better at helping communities, civil society, and media understand what we're talking about. We need to help uh, communities engage in the idea of preventing epidemics, not once the epidemic has started, but before the crisis occurs. And so this website really helps us translate that difficult data and that complex data into action that communities and civil society can take. So more than half of countries are not fully prepared for epidemics. Allows communities to understand where they are in the world and where their country fits into the scheme. So we have this uh, overall map showing uh, where their countries fit in terms of their preparedness. And what we've been able to do is to take 
the JEE that Tom talked about, the Joint External Evaluation, and demystified into what we're calling a ready score, a single number that helps countries understand where they are across the globe and help them work with their governments and their ministries of health to move forward. And so this website helps us demonstrate outbreaks across the globe. It helps communities understand the volume of outbreaks, not, hap not just occurring across the world, but in specific countries. And so how we envisage this happening and, and uh, civil society using this would be, let's say you are from Uganda. You drill down to Uganda, you can see the number of outbreaks occurring in your country and get live data about what's happening at the moment. You could go to your country page to find more about your country specifically. And here's the information about Uganda and their impact around the JE and a ready score, where they're scoring uh, in relation to other countries. So Uganda has a score of 51. They've made tremendous progress in the last few years in terms of moving forward, but still have some work to do. And this page helps outline that not only specifically for Uganda, but puts it into the context of the region where Uganda sits. So you can see South Sudan there uh, scoring around 30 with some work to do. Kenya also moving forward as, and Tanzania also. And then from here, you can drill down into more detail about the ready score specifically. So this breaks the joint external evaluation down into the key areas and helps explain what each of the scores are and shows in bar graphs where the most work is needed. So you can uh, click through, there's information on each of the indicators explaining what it, it uh, represents in clear, non-technical way. And then allows you to break it down into the progress that that country's making. So you can see here, it's a bit hard to see on the screen at the moment, but shows progress in terms of the steps that the video outlines. So you can see Uganda has already committed to a JE, completed the assessment, has already made a plan, and is working to finance that plan at the moment. And the website helps identify the strengths and the main gaps for Uganda, where work is needed to be done. You can go one step further then and look at the International Health Regulation self-assessment just as a balance and an additional indicator. And there's information about all of those different uh, pieces of, of work that goes into understanding their current status. But I think where this really gets exciting is not just knowing where the gaps are, but helping communities and civil society understand what they can do to help their country move forward. And so you can go to the Take Action page, and we've provided tools for civil society to join the conversation, not just understand the gaps for their country, but what they can do to help move forward. And so there's uh, specific advocacy tools here linked to the score. So specific um, tools for countries that are red, countries that are yellow, and most importantly, countries that haven't undertaken a JEE yet or where the score isn't known. There's information there about how they can be more informed, understanding what those scores at each country means, what the JEE is, and uh, the other indicators around the data. And then more specific tools to help civil society start the conversation at country level in terms of what they can do. So there's tools there for letter to the editor, governments, how to start a petition, and advocacy guides spe uh, specifically focused on Uganda and the context for them. So if we drill down into advocacy guides, there's specific tools there focused at community level action. And most importantly, we've tried to highlight where action is, is taking place and where success stories are occurring. So what we would like to see this website do is not necessarily be that depressing story, but really highlight that we can make progress and that countries are making progress. And so a number of inspiring stories from countries across the globe, um, including Sierra Leone, uh, Nigeria and Tanzania, highlighting the best practice. And then additional resources specifically for the press, understanding the data, frequently asked questions, really trying to round out and demystify what can be quite a complex issue. And most importantly, 
key facts about how countries can step up and make progress. So I'll leave that there. The website's now live. You'll be able to log on today and see it. I'll hand back to Dr. Frieden just to finish off. We're all connected by the air we breathe, the water we drink, the food we eat, the travel we take. Uh, a disease can go from essentially anywhere in the world to any city in the world within 36 hours. However, and here's where we get to the part where both, man, am I glad I don't work for the US government anymore. <laughs> and uh, I can say what I really think. Uh, Ron Klain did an amazing job as the Ebola czar. He didn't like the term czar, but he was the Ebola czar. Uh, some of us have been asking for a couple of months for an Ebola czar, so we were delighted to get Ron in place. And Ron was terrific in many, many ways, really was. Even if he weren't here, I would say that. But the thing he did that was, I thought, the most impactful and long-lasting was not only did he get an Ebola supplemental appropriation through Congress, and for those of you who have the fortune of not having to have, not having, to have learned the ins and outs of uh, government budgeting. That's basically money that government gives for a new project when there's an emergency or something bad that happens. And the supplemental, or sometimes something good that happens, when the supplemental came out, it was a huge fight. The administration had asked for more than $5 billion. Uh, this was just before the midterm elections. Um, there was a lot of tension over uh, travel policy, you know, immigration, what could be controversial, right? Um, and uh, someone tweeted that we shouldn't let in missionaries who were dying from the US for healthcare here. Uh, but what Ron was able to do was get the Congress to provide a billion dollars for global health security as part of the Ebola supplemental appropriation. And that was really touch and go. There were a lot of people who wanted to throw global health security under the bus and say, no, we're not gonna do that. It's not directly Ebola. And Ron said to certain elected congressmen and senators, all right, if the next epidemic comes from this country that you've cut out, we'll just say that you cut it out and that's where it came from. And Ron was able to really get a consensus, a bipartisan consensus that we should do this. And so uh, at uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Programs were started in dozens of countries around the world to make the world safer, to help countries be stronger there so we could be safer here. And those programs have made significant progress, but they're hard. They take time. And the current administration uh, has not taken steps to ensure that those programs will continue. So we face a significant problem. If the funding isn't found to continue those programs, the US will have to pull back from the front lines of the war against microbes. It will have to leave the field open, not for terrorism in this case, but for terrible organisms. And doing that means that we will all be at greater risk of disease emerging, spreading, and risking ourselves, our travelers, in a way that could have been prevented. With continued investment, we can not only keep ourselves safer, but help other countries learn to do it themselves so we don't have to be there every time. And many programs are doing that already with trained staff, with laboratory experts, with laboratory systems and tracking systems. Many, many outbreaks don't require international assistance now because the local capacity exists. But it is at enormous risk. This is an approximate example, and this I can say now that I'm not in the government, an approximate example of what the Centers for Disease Control spends and can spend on health protection, on protecting Americans here by stopping diseases there. It's been in the neighborhood since the Ebola supplemental came through of 250 to $300 million a year until now. Uh, fortunately, Congress put 50 million in to backstop the money that was ebbing from that supplemental because it's a five-year supplemental. Next year will be the last year that supplemental 
dollars are available and they'll be running on fumes. So if another 90 or 100 million dollars isn't found in the budget next year, those red countries I showed in the previous slide, those will lose the services that are needed to keep diseases there rather than risking them here. And in 20, the gap will be even larger. So unless these funds are found, there will be a significant problem in terms of our ability to protect the US. Basically, we have to protect CDC's budget so CDC can protect us. And that's the one action I'd like you to consider. For any of you who have any contact with anyone who's elected in Washington, DC, let them know that keeping America safe shouldn't be about partisan politics. Uh, wherever you are on the political spectrum, you can agree, I think, that it's a whole lot better to stop a disease where it first emerges than have to fight it somewhere else. It's also less expensive. Uh, but most importantly, it's the right thing to do. It saves lives, lives that don't have to be lost. Now, there are some resources available for global health security. The World Bank began a project called Ready Say. That program was developed in 2015. Three years later, and two years after the World Bank board approved it, this is the disbursement rate as of January this year, 4%. It's 4% dispersed. So it's not just a question of money. It's a question of ensuring that countries have the capacity to use the money that's provided. What we've done at Resolve to Save Lives is provide Nigeria with a few staff to help them get this moving. And now, just in the past three or four months, it's gone from essentially not started to already beginning implementation. And we're working to do that with other places. But this means that it's not just uh, an issue for the, <clears throat> for the US. It's not just an issue for the countries. It's a <clears throat> an issue for the global network of organizations that support countries to make progress. And this is not going to go away. Outbreaks are a persistent threat. This is data from this week. Uh, there are 52 ongoing alerts. There are 46 outbreaks. There are nine humanitarian crises. Uh, there are new events coming uh, every week. Uh, we've shown Africa because the hand that's been dealt means there's a large human-animal interface. Uh, it also means that given the history of Africa, the systems are not in place in many of the countries that need to be in place. Um, and that is a commitment that all of us should have. If any country anywhere in the world lacks the resources to find an outbreak or a health threat when it first emerges, we are all at greater risk. We don't know where the next outbreak will come from. And frankly, no matter how much intelligence and creativity is put into disease prediction, we would never have predicted H1N1 would come from Mexico, that there would be MERS in the Middle East, that uh, we would have this huge outbreak of Ebola in West Africa. And we don't know what the next HIV or drug-resistant bacteria will be. But we do know that if we've got a blind spot anywhere, we're all at greater risk. But we all have the opportunity to close those gaps, to step up to preparedness. We have new information. And with that comes a unique responsibility, a unique opportunity to work together for a safer world. Thank you very much. OK, you're going to bolt us in. Tom, I just don't know how you tip more towards optimistic than depressing, <laughs> um, but we'll get to that. Let me share with you while we're getting uh, hooked up here. Just to my left, uh, of course, is Ron Klain. Uh, Ron has been chief of staff to just about everyone important, including the Ebola virus, I suppose, uh, uh, and, and taking it down was, 
was, as Tom laid out, the Ebola czar. He was chief of staff to Vice President Biden, chief of staff to Vice President Al Gore, uh, staff director for the Senate Democratic Leadership Committee. Uh, he's now uh, vice president, EVP and general counsel uh, at Revolution and invests uh, in firms. To his left is Ann Shukit, is principal deputy director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, how did you like Tom's pitch for you? Did that go okay? You like it? I, I have no Can you say you like it? Yeah, yeah. I, no I just wanted to test uh, the resilience here of, of, of not advocating for your own budget. But how much money do you, and we'll get to that, how much money do you need to save the world? Um, and then we have, uh, of course, uh, Seth Berkeley is the CEO of Gavi, the, the Vaccine Alliance. Um, and what I want to thank him for, and when I mentioned he was a hero, is he was uh, founded the International AIDS Vaccine Initiative, and uh, very good. And we all know now Tom Frieden. I want to just say a plug for the Atlantic, and this month's Atlantic issue that has just come out, and I think it's out now, um, is one of the more clarifying and stark presentations about this very subject written by my colleague Ed Yong, uh, and it's called The Next Plague is Coming, Is America Ready? And what I didn't realize, and I look at myself as a semi-informed guy, but I didn't realize how ignorant I, I actually was of the numbers, things that, are, that you have great facility in, in terms of the awareness of um, the, the vulnerabilities and the fragility uh, that society has. I didn't realize that a normal year, uh, for instance, of non-pandemic flus, you still lose 500,000 people. I did not realize that collectively we'd lost 35 million people to AIDS. Um, uh, I did not realize that even uh, with H1N1 or a strain of H1N1, and this is you know 100 years ago, 1918, 100 million people died, 5% of the world's population at that time died from uh, H1N1, and that um, the recent strain of H1N1, and I know all of you are uh, uh, experts in this, apparently according to what I've read, and I don't know if it's wrong, infected uh, 60 million people, not many died, but it gives you a scale of vulnerability, and this is with world-class alert systems. Uh, uh, Tom Frieden was quoted as saying, you know, people were upset about uh, inoculating. You can't yell at the eggs to get them to grow uh, uh, the, the vaccines faster. So this is a situation where I think, I guess I want to start this off with Ron and just say, we've heard Tom's discussion, but I also feel like we've somehow buffered ourselves from awareness of the seriousness of these issues. And I guess I want to start out with something like Ebola or another strain of H1N1. Do we actually need to see another mass casualty incident to snap into the kind of place that Tom is talking about we need to be? Uh, well, thanks, Steve. And uh, I want to thank Tom for those kind words and for revealing that I extorted money out of the Congress of the United <laughs> States. Pre appreciate that uh, disclosure here. Uh, look. Um, don't take my word for it. Bill Gates has said that the single most likely thing that could take 30 million excess lives in a given year uh, is a pandemic of some sort. And he said he thinks there's a 50-50 chance that'll happen in his lifetime. So the risk is there. And I think if you just uh, pull back and look at this from an American perspective, from a US perspective, are we ready? We're in the upper quadrant of Tom's uh, grid we're one of those green countries. But even so, we have five big gaps here in the US and one giant gap. The five big gaps are we have a leadership gap. There's no one at the White House right now who's in charge of this problem. We have a funding gap. Tom talked about some of that on the global side, but on our domestic investments too, we're underfunding, underinvesting. We have a facilities and training gap. Uh, we, you know, we trained a lot of people in a lot of aspects of this right after the Ebola outbreak. Training needs to be renewed. People need to be drilled. Our first responders need to be trained. We need uh, better and more facilities. We have a gap there. We obviously have a science gap. We haven't yet developed all the vaccines and the therapeutics we need. We have a policy gap. There are holes in American law that we need to fill about things like licensing people in the event of emergency to practice in other states or using the Stafford Act to respond to emergencies. Those are our five big domestic gaps. Our sixth giant gap is the global gap Tom was talking about. We can't be safe here in America when there's a risk of pandemics around the world. The world's just too small, diseases spread too quickly, uh, and, uh, and just to put a point on it, there is no wall we can build that is high enough <laughs> to keep viruses and the disease threat out of the United States. We have to engage in the world. That's why what Tom is talking about is so very, very important. You know, when I, again, going back to the Ed Young article, and you talked about walls, whatever, but I, 
Uh, again, I, according to him, there are literally hundreds of thousands of potential viruses existing in animals today that could eventually jump to humans. Uh, and some of these are in places like deep jungles, and part of the story of Ebola is that it was very remote. Uh, and until, as Tom said, until someone traveled from one country to another, until a nice new road uh, went in to provide access. So it, it does raise the interesting question of walling yourself off. Um, and, and maybe that's impossible to go back and do now, but are there places in the world that are so rich with danger in this front that it does make sense not to turn them into Mini, metop mini metropolises. I'll go to you still, Ron. Before oh, no, I mean, that's crazy. That's just craziness, right? I mean, I think, I think, uh, look, he this is, to say, I thought. Yeah, th this, this is, we live in an interconnected world. And by and large, that is a fantastic thing for raising people out of poverty, for creating the chance for higher standards of living around the world, for exchanges of commerce and culture and learning and all these things. But it does have this negative side effect. The disease could happen in the most remote part of the world. A day later, someone with a disease could be in a regional capital. A day later, someone can be on a plane and fly to any place in the world. That is the reality of the world we live in. We can't turn the clock back on that. We shouldn't try to turn the clock back on that. But we can do the kinds of things that Tom has talked about to make us all safer, to invest in strengthening health systems overseas, do the kinds of work Tom's talked about to make uh, those countries safer and make us safer as a result. So let me go to Ann now. I've been really waiting to ask this question. Ann, I've watched video. We had a nice little encounter outside. You always seem co so calm and collected in talking about, you know, end of the world scenarios and, and, <laughs> and things. And so I'm interested in what are your up at night issues? You know, what, what, what disasters truly scare you? Because that will help kind of create context for us about what we should worry about. Yeah, well, before I get to that, I, I just want to say, even if we kept everybody where they are and didn't let them fly anywhere, right. the bats and the birds have pretty wide ranges. Yes. So I think the diseases can get almost anywhere. Don't forget the mosquitoes. Yeah. The mosquitoes don't fly right. as far, yeah, but they, fly they, but they, but they get in the vessels. Yeah. 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 But um, you know, the, the biggest risk in terms of cataclysmic is a pandemic of influenza. And it's different than most other scary viruses because it can happen everywhere almost at the same time. And regardless of the development level, regardless of the healthcare system, we're pretty much all vulnerable. So can I ask you to just give us a quick primer? Because I think there are a lot of people who are not sort of influenza pros in the audience. Some might be. But, but just every year, even with the best preparation, right. we, how many people um, uh, get infected? How many people do we lose even in a good sure. year? Sure. You know, it, it, it can be 20% of people that can get flu in a, in a moderately bad year. Um, and the range of deaths just in the United States is from about 12,000 to about 60,000 per year. Um, this past year, we probably had more people die than that because it was a severe year. And even a severe regular year of influenza can be difficult. Probably many of you or your families got sick this year. The vaccine didn't work as well as we wanted. The whole country was affected at the same time. We had spot shortages of antivirals. It was, it was quite difficult. But why isn't the fever about this higher? I mean, are, have we just normalized, oh, people just die of flu, big, no big deal? Well, there was a lot of fever this winter. I don't know if yeah. you were, when I was on TV a few times, but you know, there, people were not expecting it to be as bad as it was, and there was a lot of um, frustration with the state of our responsiveness and the, and the performance of our vaccines as well. But, um, but a pandemic is much, much worse. 2009, we were really lucky. The influenza pandemic was a strain that didn't um, hit elderly people hard. And so we had actually less deaths that year than mm -hmm. in a normal year, but we had excess deaths in young people. And we were stretched to respond to that. We didn't get vaccine in large quantities till after the peak. Um, there was you know, um, excess morbidity that really didn't, uh, that, that wasn't good. Um, but a pandemic of a more severe strain would really be difficult everywhere in the world. I want to jump to Seth, but how prepared are we for next year? Um, well, there's some things that we've learned in terms of the, um, the antiviral distribution. I, I know there's some other sessions here about brand drugs and generic drugs and just, you know, supply chains and how to get better um, visibility of product where you need it. Um, we have probably a better 
strain being used for the vaccine production. Uh, we had plenty of vaccine last year, just the vaccine didn't work as well as we like. But every year is different with flu, and you just don't know what we're gonna what we're gonna be facing. Seth, I know you're out there also working on the vaccine front. One of the things that really interested me, and I apologize for getting some of this wrong, but um, I interviewed last year a guy named Luke DeBren, who was head, I think, of global vaccines for GSK, and he said. He basically took me through and educated me about the economics of vaccines, which were pretty shitty, uh, in terms of, of, of creating incentives for private players out there to do that, that the money, the, the assets that are behind vaccine development is about 3% of the entire industry, and that you know when you have a, a vaccine, like Ebola is not a profitable vaccine to prepare for, is what I learned. And so a lot of the, 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 the problems that we have out there uh, potentially brewing where you, where you could conceivably prepare, there's not an economics that supports that. I know you're trying to remedy that. Tell me where I'm wrong, one, and, and tell me, two, where, am I, where I'm really, really right in the sense of what you're trying to fix. So I'll answer that question in a second. I wanted to agree, agree with Anne because, um, you know, for the people who understand these diseases, flu is the one that keeps you up at night of the known diseases. I just mm -hmm. want to make sure, you know, we say that because Tom right. talked about that. The second point is that, you know, in, in uh, 1918, when it killed 50 to 100 million people, we didn't have those airplanes that you saw flying all around the world, and right. it still spread across the world. So to that point that, you know, this is not something about, in those days, most people lived within 50 miles of where they were born, and most people. And today we have a billion people that are outside of their country of origin every year. So it is a completely you know, different piece. To go to your questions, actually vaccines aren't good business now. And a number of the companies are actually have their most profitable uh, vaccines or, or their most profitable divisions being vaccines. We've had, you know, over the last 20 years, we've had a number of blockbuster vaccines. Those are, you know, over a billion dollars. Some is going as high as five billion. So it is good business for global vaccines that are recommended for the world and particularly for wealthy countries. Our role in that has been to try to get those vaccines available for poor countries right. by working with companies to make sure we have universal access. Now, what he was absolutely right about is something like Ebola. So take us before the picture Tom showed you. There had been 25 outbreaks of Ebola since 1976 when it was first discovered. Most of them were two to 300 people in sporadic areas in the poorest countries in the world. You know, there is no marketplace there to create a vaccine. And so one of the questions is nobody had predicted the type of outbreak. The reason we had a vaccine actually is because people after um, uh, September 11th um, and the anthrax attacks, people began to invest in it as potentially as a biological warfare weapon, which is why a fair amount of work had gone into Ebola vaccines. But the point was is there was not an economic for that. But this is, this is about not having a forward view because you know, if you look at the preparation we do for war, if you look at the preparation we do for other things, we spend a lot of money on things that are very low probability. So the question is, should we be doing this? Now, um, uh, last year, a new organization was put together called CEPI, whose role was to start to invest in vaccines for some of these rare um, infectious diseases that could potentially cause epidemics. The challenge is, of course, you can't predict, as, as Tom said. So they might invest on five vaccines. They might get the vaccines all the way forward, and a sixth agent might cause the epidemic or a seventh. But the question is, if you're looking at the whole globe, does it make sense to invest in these? And of course, the answer is yes. The challenge is we don't have good ways to pay for this. And, and you know, is the question is, should the US government be paying for every vaccine, every drug, every disease in the world? Of course not, but that requires global uh, compacts that requires working with other partners across the world, and, and that's what we need to do if we want to make sure that we're prepared for these. As I understand it, there's a group, I may get this wrong, but CEPI. But CEPI uh, was uh, the one I mentioned. CEPI yeah. was there, and so in that case, you've got researchers sort of anticipating and looking and looking at everything like, you but know. No, but they're doing action. three or four pathogens yeah. yes. right. out of what could be, you know, thousands of potential pathogens. Right. Of course, you know, we, we don't know what we don't know. So right. one interesting thing they're doing is, can we create platform technologies right. that you could just pop in you know, a particular antigen and use that platform Decode technology? It. Yeah. That's a little bit what happened with some of the vaccines that, that were used around Ebola. They were mm -hmm. vaccines that had been used for HIV and for right. TB and other aspects. And all the research had been paid for 
trying to create those vaccines. And so they took out the HIV piece, they put the Ebola piece in. And I mean, I'm simplifying it a little bit, but, but you can do that. And so the question is, you know, preparing for that. But if you want big companies to do it, mm -hmm. you have to put the incentives in place. And you also have to pay for the opportunity cost. Because if they take their best vaccinologist and put them on Ebola, they're not working on the next blockbuster vaccine. And if you're doing small companies, they might do that, but they have a different track record. So that's, that's the challenge. So Tom, and, and all of you, I, I need to kind of ask you a geopolitical question because it seems to me like this is a very fragile time in global affairs. It seems to me after watching the G7 in Canada, I, I, I sort of saw this in Hamburg in the G20, that the United States seems to be walking away from its enthusiasm for global stuff on all fronts. And there's a trust problem out there that seems to be building. Uh, I just met with leaders uh, uh, across Europe, and they will privately say they no longer trust the United States for their dark days, whatever those dark days may be. And these are our closest allies in the world. And, and so I'm interested in whether that affects your world or not. Uh, and I go back just on May 9th this year, George W. Bush uh, did a wonderful job kind of memorializing, looking back and commemorating PEPFAR. Uh, the 20th anniversary of PEPFAR. And it was an incredibly, you know, tribute, bipartisan uh, discussion about what had been, you know, and it made me reflect on today. So if you were to grade us today, the Trump administration, even the Obama administration in contrast with the, the Bush administration and what it led on, on PEPFAR, how, what do you feel about where the world is tipping and how the current administration is approaching some of these, these issues? And remember, first, you no longer work for the government. Yeah. First, uh, PEPFAR is an amazing accomplishment. It, it is a game-changing, world-changing initiative. I have colleagues who worked in, in Malawi and elsewhere for decades and who described the advent of HIV where it seemed like, talk about pessimism, all hope was lost. The only businesses flourishing were uh, undertakers and coffin makers to treatment coming in and suddenly a truly new hope and uh, rebounding life expectancy, increased uh, improved health systems. So PEPFAR has been a huge success, which wouldn't have been possible without George W. Bush's leadership on it. Um, I think that the, the next big thing in public health is global health security. And the, the baton has been passed from the Obama administration to the Trump administration, and they haven't yet dropped it. Uh, they haven't necessarily picked it up enthusiastically, but they've said good things about it. Mm. Uh, they've actually put $59 million more in CDC's proposed budget next year. That doesn't, that's not 100, but it's not zero either. Um, so I, I think jury is still out. Uh, there's obviously a lot of changes at the White House, and there are different ways to run programs. Sometimes the locus of effective programs is in the agencies, and sometimes it's outside of the agencies. And, you know, if I were CDC and seeing the White House kind of distracting other things, I would move very rapidly forward in doing the things that they say they want to have done because they've said very good things about uh, commitment to global health security. But you know, show me your budget, I'll talk, show you your values. Uh, the, the real question here is, can we maintain the focus on this area that's a little hard to understand, a little hard to explain? And that's what our website is hoping to do a bit of, though it's really focused on low and middle income countries. But, but the issue is CEPI, for example. Really exciting, $500 million. We're not in it, right? Um, what's the U.S. doing? Nothing, really. Well, they're, they're collaborating with uh, BARDA and others. With yeah, we, yeah. We collaborating, zero dollars collaborating. Well, our, yeah. our BARDA actually does the same thing, mm. so we're now getting, uh, CEPI's getting other governments to, and, and other partners to, to buy into I the see. same kind of energy. I sense that Ron's hair is on fire. A, a little bit. So, so yeah. uh, you know. <laughs> uh, but how do you really feel? Yeah, so, so look, uh, I have a big career as a partisan, so I'm going to just lay that out there. It's a fact. But I, what I will say is I've tried very hard in this area to really uh, take a nonpartisan approach to the issue of pandemic prevention. And as Tom mentioned, we had great bipartisan support on Capitol Hill for the Ebola response. I've certainly acclaimed what President Bush did in PEPFAR. And this should not be a political or partisan issue. It hasn't been. Uh, viruses don't ask your party affiliation before they infect you. That said, there is real reason to be scared of the idea of us facing this threat with Donald Trump in the White House. And there are three specific reasons why I make that provocative statement. 
Uh, the first is that the president is anti-science. He trades in attacking experts. He trades in conspiracy theories. All those things would lead to the loss of many lives in the event of an epidemic in the United States. We would need the public not to trade in conspiracy theories, not to believe that the news was fake, but to respect scientific expertise. Secondly, he has an incredibly isolationist mindset, and that leads to the US pulling back from its leadership and its involvement in these global crises. And that is also going to be a serious threat to our security. And finally, he has policies and views that are xenophobic, if not racist, and those lead to blaming immigrants and foreigners for problems when we need public health interventions. And I will say that these statements aren't hypothetical. We saw what President Trump said as a citizen during the Ebola outbreak in 2014, where he tweeted false information, where he attacked medical experts, and where he said explicitly that doctors and nurses from America who are fighting Ebola in West Africa who got sick should be left there to die. And fortunately, President Obama did not listen to that, and I've met the brave men and women who we medevac back here and who are alive and well as a result of that. More recently, during the Zika outbreak in 2015 and 2016, the kind of xenophobic attitudes that the president promoted was one of the reasons why Congress did not fund promptly the Zika response package. When I would advocate for that, what I heard time and again was, Zika isn't a public health problem, it's an immigration problem. Just keep those people from Latin America and South America out of the country, we won't have Zika. So we need leadership that is focused, that is pro-science, that doesn't traffic in conspiracies, that invests in these things, and that doesn't have these isolationist attitudes. And those attitudes put us all at risk. Most, most world leaders that, that, I, uh, that I've met, no matter how they campaign to get into office, and I you know, have, have had the privilege meeting world leaders say um, that once they're sitting behind that executive desk, the world looks differently, that they can't, they can't maintain the same, same biases that they had before. They've got to weigh different equities. In other words, they need to become responsible. And this raises the interesting question about um, the, the current president and, and a crisis that comes. I don't know if there's a predictability, but other folks that I've heard talk about this have said there is a bit of a cycle of when you can begin to expect another major challenge. And so we've had essentially 19 months of the Trump administration. How long, given our history of major health challenges, do you think it will be before this administration is, is squarely challenged by a major health, health challenge? Ann? You know, I think there's an independent probability of pandemics every right. year, so we, we really don't have a timeline on them. But one thing I would say is, um, you know, to get us out of the depression mode, um, the, um, the people pay attention when things are falling apart, right. when we have Ebola, when we have Zika um, or H1N1. And it's really difficult to sustain interest and overcome complacency when there's not, you know, the corpses mm -hmm. piling up or your family is at risk. But we had an opportunity this past couple months with a scare, a serious Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm -hmm. And our government did pay attention and the administration did take it very seriously. Fortunately, you know, because of um, investments that have been made in strengthening capacity in the DRC, in the ability for their laboratory to identify the strain, in the ability for trained staff to get to the field, and the improvements at WHO, which got you know, leadership on the ground quickly to assess and help with a surge, US government is part of that response. We have people from CDC in country helping, and a vaccine that was tested two years ago during the Ebola in West Africa that's actually being used investigationally to control the outbreak. So the, the, you know, one hopes that a contained outbreak is enough to make the case of why we need to invest rather than a completely out of control outbreak or a catastrophe. So I don't know whether, you know, the political side of it, but I do think this pr recent experience is a really good um, lesson of why we need to keep, keep the investments. I mean, I was there um, and, it, you know, it was touch and go at the beginning, mm -hmm. as it always is in these types of mm -hmm. events. And because one of the problems is 
you know, I was there because of the vaccine. The vaccine was there because, you know, the foresight was to try to make sure there would be vaccine available in case there was an epidemic mm. before there was a licensed product. And so that was the advanced purchase commitment we did with Merck to make that happen. Um, I must say that when I tried to fundraise for that, we, we agreed during the height of the Ebola crisis to say we'd put up to $300 million available for companies to be able to purchase their products so they would know there would be somebody to purchase right. it. And um, when I went afterwards, it was like, during that period, it was like, no matter whatever it takes, money's not the object, doesn't matter. Two months later, oh, that's yesterday's problem. You know, we, we, we've moved on, we're not interested. So this sustained interest is a problem. But, I think that, you know, and and's right. A lot of little things got better, and we did have a new tool, but it could have gone the other way. I mean, the yeah. virus ended up, you know, going from, you know, Bacoro into, you know, a, a Bandica, which is a, you know, a, a provincial trading capital upriver with Central African Republic. Across the way was Republic of Congo. Down was Angola. You know, all it took was somebody moving somebody in a, in a canoe to one of those places, have it be underground for a while and have it start spread. And so, I mean, the challenge is going to be, you can't predict when they're going to occur, but what you can predict is they're going to constantly be occurring. You just can't tell when they're going to spin out of control. And, and that's why having this global preparation is so critical. You know, it is interesting. We have so many applications of virtual reality today. You can go down and swim with fish or look at a refugee camp. But, you know, it made me wonder, you know, thinking about how you might respond to this, whether we need uh, virtual reality to remember horror as well, uh, to take people back so that they're not able to have amnesia uh, and just, just forget, if you will, uh, what's happened in the past. Maybe that could, you've got some great graphics up there. Maybe this can be uh, your next thing, Tom. But that's one uh, of the things yeah. is preparing, you know, and doing, I mean, Bill Gates made this point over and over is, you know, what do we do for war? We're constantly practicing, we're constantly testing, we're, you know, going out and, and that's not done. Now, I know when Tom was commissioner in New York, uh, I think you and Bloomberg did, did it in New York. Right. There's been a few other episodes, but we are not practicing in that same the, way. The, the challenge is really making real what is somewhat theoretical, that there could be a problem and therefore we have to make systems. But we don't need exercises because reality gives us our drills day in and day out. All around the world there are outbreaks, there are public health programs running, and we will be successful at making the world safer from epidemics when we have improved public health programs around the world so that you have laboratory networks, you have information systems. It's not as sexy as CEPI, mm -hmm. but it's essential to protect people. And that's what we hope we can trigger progress on. There is interest, there's commitment. Uh, in my current role where I go into country with our staff goes into country, we say we'd like to help you uh, do a better job stopping right. infectious diseases. There's no opposition. It's just, it's hard. The public health program may be poorly funded. There may not be enough staff. It's very different from going in and the prior program I did, you know, we're going to get tobacco control done in sure. the country. There, yeah. There's not political opposition. Yeah, I think that often, um, you know, the sexy part is that billion dollar new, dr new drug or vaccine that's going to save us if we get this virus. But the tried and true classic methods are what stopped SARS, which was a really scary mm -hmm. virus, you know, killing doctors and nurses, spreading from multiple continents shutting down hospitals in China, in Toronto, or MERS, you know, right. shutting down a hospital in, Cor in South Korea. And having a skilled public health workforce that knows how to do surveillance and contact tracing and labs that work, having infection control doesn't just help, you know, stop SARS from spreading, but helps with tuberculosis and helps with drug-resistant bacteria as well. So there's, there's a way to invest in this that's not very sexy, but that has um, value every day for the citizens of the countries. I mean, you know, the complacency. Nothing is, against vaccines. Is, yeah. No, complacency is the is the opposite of that. So let me change diseases. Mm. Um, you know, yellow fever. So Rockefeller, right. you know, got a Nobel Prize for having made a vaccine, 1936. The vaccine got down to 19 cents a dose, really cheap. Mm. One lifetime dose gives you protection. And, you know, the challenge is it's not really very widely used and not at the level that gives protection. So we recently had an outbreak in Angola. It took a long time to diagnose it. People lied and had fake cards. Not only did that outbreak spread to multiple countries in Africa, but 12 mm -hmm. citizens 
went back to China, and there is the same mosquito in Asia, but it's not circulating there. Had that taken off, you know, God only knows what would have happened. And so, you know, here's an example of where we have an existing prevention, and the challenge there is to get countries to not be complacent. Frankly, we even pay for the vaccine, so it's mm -hmm. not even a cost issue. It's about having the political will and having the desire to have high coverage with this once, you know, one dose lifetime protection vaccine in the belt of, of, of for yellow. Let, let me ask you guys one last question, then I want to go to the audience. And I'm sensitive to the audience. I was just out there meeting a number of folks that, that are visiting here from Africa. One uh, young lady here in the middle is from uh, Liberia, from um, Aspen, one of the Aspen voices, young voices. Um, and I think you've spoken about this before, about the difference between the developing world and the developed world. What I'm interested in sometimes are blind spots or literacy challenge, challenges in the developed world. That in the developing world, you know, what I'm fascinated by, if I go to an African country, the, 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 I, I, I've seen people much more aware of how to use their smartphone to you know, look at their heart, cardiovascular situation, which I know is another dimension of what Tom's uh, group works on, or, you know, knowing other dimensions of sort of health uh, uh, benchmarks, and, and they're tied into their smartphone, they've got smart stuff. Qualcomm has funded, you know, a ton of these, these kinds of initiatives out there. But when I go to Bartlesville, Oklahoma, or I go to Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or I go to Dubuque, Iowa, I see highly illiterate folks about their own health, and I don't see healthcare systems that I, at least from, from my side as a, on the retail side, that seem to be up to the standard that you're talking about. So I'm sort of interested in whether there's a little bit of hubris packed into what we think we're doing in the United States if we had something serious break out here. So talk me down, and am I wrong that there's some strengths in the developing world that we don't talk about enough? Yeah, I think there's two areas that I would point out. You know, one is um, delivery of, of interventions. You know, many develop, developing countries are very familiar with planning, executing, and succeeding in mass vaccination campaigns, whether it's for measles and rubella or for, um, or for polio, um, mass antibiotic campaigns for, right. for trachoma. Um, the U.S. Is just hasn't been doing that for a really long time. So even in 2009, when we did, you know, got 80 million people vaccinated against H1N1 influenza, um, that was a stretch for us. We didn't have that as a, uh, it was a stretch for our systems and it was a stretch for the public. And I think in, in communities around the world where mass campaigns have been happening because there wasn't right. as strong uh, primary health, um, that's still there. The other thing I think is, is around community engagement and trust. Uh, I met with folks from California in the health department responding to the wildfires. Mm. And I mean, everybody heard those tragic stories of, um, you know, people, you know, somebody knocked on a door to try to warn a neighbor to evacuate and the fear of who was at the door. You know, mm. I'm not gonna open the door. I don't trust my neighbors. I don't know my neighbors. We're not a community anymore. And so I think that there's a lot to build on in developing countries and a lot we can learn from. And, and I do think we have to be very humble in the United States. We spend a lot of money on things. Right, but right. Ron? We still have a lot of improvement. Yeah, and I, I absolutely agree with what Ann said, and I'd only add to that um, this uh, growing uh, anti-science skepticism we have about vaccines in our own country. And so one of the most ironic conversations I'd have during the Ebola outbreak would be people would say, I don't understand why people in West Africa engage in these burial practices. They're spreading the disease. Can't you just explain the science to them? Can't you just tell them this is bad? And, and someone would have this conversation with me, and in the morning newspaper, there'd be a story about a measles outbreak in Orange County, California, because people in America didn't believe in science and didn't think their children should be vaccinated. Right. So, you know, we have to constantly be vigilant here about making sure that in our own country, we're aware of the importance of vaccination, we're aware of the importance of the scientific developments, the issue of trust, which someone mentioned at the kickoff of Spotlight Health uh, yesterday, and, uh, and reinforced here is an important issue, but we can't let our guard down. Complacency, as Seth mentioned, is a huge problem. We're seeing this a little bit in our own healthcare system now around uh, pandemic response. After the Ebola outbreak, we set up these 10 regional hospitals that are 
ready to, uh, supposedly ready to treat uh, an outbreak of a dangerous infectious disease. And last year, the time it would take one of those hospitals to accept a patient actually went up. We got less prepared last year as we get a little further away from the crisis and everyone lets their guard down just a little bit. You know, we have, we have cancer vaccines. I mean, you know, and mm -hmm. cervical cancer vaccine, uh, Rwanda has a 92% uh, coverage rate. I remember you tweeted and said, if only we had a coverage rate like Rwanda, we would save X numbers of women in the United States. I mean, it's, it's really crazy. So, you know, not only complacency, but um, it's this issue of who do you trust? And on the internet, you know, they have these fancy names of anti-vaccine sites that kind of sound like CDC and national vaccine site, you know, and, and and, and the problem is, is that it's hard to tell truth from non-truth in that circumstance. The other area where the whole world needs to get better is keeping health workers safe. We don't do a great job of this in any country. Uh, decades from now, we'll look back at hospitals in the U.S. and we'll say, what were we thinking? Mm. How could we allow this kind of practice to go on tens of thousands of deaths a year from infections picked up in the hospital? And in uh, low- and middle-income countries, also tremendous problems with hospital infection control, lack of water, lack of gloves, um, deaths in this outbreak in Ebola, in DRC, in Nipah, in Kerala, India. And we can't have the healthcare workers be the canary in the minefield. We have to. One, one of the things them. I really liked about the Ed Young article was the inventory of, of, of the footprint of this and, and, and how he put numbers to it that I think we're pretty well buffered from, unfortunately, in our daily awareness about these issues, but thank you so much. Let me open up the floor. Yes, this gentleman right here, and we're going to run a mic. Do we have a mic on us? Hello. And we're right. then going to go down here to the second. We got so many in the second row, you might as well come down, and then we'll go in the back, too. But we're going to do lightning round, so fast questions, fast answers. Go ahead. So um, I had the opportunity to award the X Prize to uh, Gene. Tell Major. us who you are. Oh, John Madison, Singularity University, Kaiser Permanente. Terrific. Um, and uh, I awarded the X Prize for sensing to a company that has a product called Gene Radar, which has an emergency use authorization for Ebola and Zika and soon to be many other uh, pandemic like viruses. Um, my question is Are any of you familiar with that technology? It's point of care testing, PCR, so that you can within minutes know if someone has been exposed at very, very high level sensitivity? And is that baked into any of your planning um, in Africa? M my last comment is. I have uh, a plan I'm working on right now to do the same for uh, a pandemic within the U.S. With it starting in our organization. Thank you. Point of care testing. Yeah, yeah. The revolution is really exciting in diagnostics, and so even in DRC, um, in the Ebola response, they've been really able to rule out cases before they make it on the suspect case list. So we're, we're really, and during the Ebola response, Tom saw, you know, so much effort shipping specimens for um, for growth and the, the PCRs and, and so forth are really game changing. Great, right here. Yes. Um, my name is Stella. I'm from Kenya. I'm a medical doctor. I'm also an Aspen 2018 fellow. Allow me to ask two critical questions, especially when you think. I mean, the discussion is let's invest in other countries to be able to protect the U.S. And two critical questions, especially when I see um, health policy, global health policy Short makers questions. here. Yeah. One is when we have such discussions, the one critical people that we don't see are the business people. And here I'm talking about the World Trade Organization. It's because part of the problems that we have in developing countries is surrounded around um, intellectual property and the TRIPS agreement that we are having this. The other critical question that perhaps I would want to ask is, even when we are talking about IMF, World Bank giving us money, and we're already in debt and we have corruption, and they're structuring our loans. I mean, how do we, when do we prioritize health when you have competing priorities like nutrition? Mm -hmm. So even as we're discussing health, can you also start thinking about the other social determinants of health that are impacting how we are uptaking the multiple health interventions? Thank Good you. Good question, let me, uh, please, Seth. So um, there is a interesting discussion on bringing the private sector into these issues. The World Economic Forum has a whole track on this where they try to bring the hospitality industry, trade industry, and others into that. The challenge has been, of course, is that many 
don't see this as a priority. And, and when epidemics go away for a, a year or two, it's top of the risk register and then it drops off. So again, it's this complacency that's a problem. In terms of your second question, it is a real issue because you know, if all of this does get shifted to the bank and it's being you know, used with, um, uh, with concessional loans, then there is a problem with countries taking on additional I will just say that the main target of the website we've released is civil society and low and middle income countries to provide tools to advocate for transparent, effective, committed resources, because most of the resources will come from the countries themselves, not from global assistance. Great. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm Gokul Swaminathan. I'm, I work at Merck. Um, I'm in the vaccines group. So thank you very much for everything you said. Yeah, no more thank yous, just short questions. Great. Yeah. So uh, um, what we're talking about is diagnosis, early diagnosis of humans and prevention of humans. A common theme with these pandemics are, are they're zoonotic. They're coming from animals. So what type of global engagement is, is, is in detection in, in animals and potentially eradicating it from animals? Great, thank you. Anne or Ron? Yeah, there are efforts in terms of a One Health agenda where animal-human health get merged and there's collaboration, coordination, and, and research as well. So there's a, a global viral genome project that's actually finding all those viruses that are out in different animal species um, and getting a database together to help us with prediction. But um, in, the, in the here and now, the agricultural practices, the live bird markets in China, there's so much that we can do today with the pathogens we already know about to improve the safety for humans and to improve um, animal health as well. And Ron? If I use 15 seconds, a little ad here for some focus and attention to climate change. Climate change is causing animal and human populations to come into greater contact. It's putting animal habitat at risk. It's uh, spreading these animal vectors into new places where they never were before. We're seeing the 80s Egypti mosquito exist in parts of the United States and around the world where it hasn't before. So we really can't talk about pandemic prevention in the long run without addressing climate change. And, and, and stop antibiotic use in animals. Right here, yes, go ahead. From Uganda and uh, Aspen New Voices Fellow. The example that vaccines are available and are not being used, and I want to uh, shoot this to Tom, the assessment criteria that you have put for epidemic assessment and readiness for the countries lacks the community component. It is all on the supply side. Isn't there something we need to find out about the communities that would help in you know, timely response Thank to you. epidemics? Thank you. Actually, a crucial component of preparedness is the ability to effectively engage communities to do that before there's an outbreak so that you have the connections and the trusted leaders and the communication methodology, and that is one of the capacities that's assessed. Yes, right here in the, yes, you. Hi, Anne Catherine Wells with Medtronic Foundation. Just a quick question, I think um, it's great to hear all of this evidence, but I think sometimes we're preaching to the choir of we're all in this room and we care about it. So how are you reframing this so that it's not just it must be somebody else's priority when it's clearly not. How are you, how can we translate this into jobs created, innovation hubs, something you know, that it would be in it for them today so that there's a real value there? So I think the question was about incentives. I want to say The Atlantic wrote a very scary article, which is part of an incentive, you know, a negative incentive. But, but when you look at uh, getting the incentives right, and I was very impressed, well, you, you thought you, had to, you actually had to create the market for Merck to move. How many more markets do you need to move? How do you get the incentives right? Well, I want to go back to the point you made because I do think the demand side is absolutely critical. And so for me, when I'm talking about creating demand, it's about local political demand and getting communities engaged to understand the value of these products and to have their, their own beliefs. So mm -hmm. it isn't Gavi that says, you ought to take this vaccine. We help subsidize those vaccines, but it's national decision making. Mm -hmm. And it, it's interesting, we're working with Aspen to help strengthen some of the local decision-making bodies so that they can use technical knowledge and work to have champions to move forward. You know, in a sense, you know, all health is local. Right. And so but, but to her question as well, what do we do to kind of broaden the incentives for other players to move in this field? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that you know what we have to do is make sure that we map out all of the interventions we need and then look at the incentives that are required for each one, and they're going to be different, whether they be industry engagement, but also all of the other groups we have to have involved. And I mean, Tom talked about the just-in-time supply chain that we exist around the world. We have to change that if we want to be prepared in the future for epidemics. So it means changing incentive structures across a you know, wide range of industries groups. Right here, yes. Uh, my name is Steve. If the United States drops the ball in the leadership, who's going to pick it up? Mm. Great question. Ron Klain. China. Yeah. China was on the scene during the Ebola outbreak in West uh, Africa and probably uh, uh, played a larger role uh, in this DRC response than we did, at least an equal role. Uh, that is, uh, you know, look, uh, an increasingly multilateral world is a good thing in many ways. Having more countries, not having the world be dependent on the U.S. to rush to the lead is a good thing. But, you know, a couple things, right? We don't really know if the vaccines the Chinese are making and giving people in these countries are really safe, how they've been tested, what the transparency on that is. Uh, we, we don't want to cede leadership in this field to the Chinese. And, and to the extent uh, that those vaccines don't work, it's going to undermine confidence in vaccines. So I do think we, we have both the obligation to lead and a lot is gained by the U.S. being a leader in this I saw field. you both smiling. It isn't only, by the way, China, because I agree with everything that Ron said. I mean, Angela Merkel got really obsessed about this during Ebola and made this a priority. The U.K.'s made it a priority. The challenge has been the U.S. set up this mm -hmm. global system. And so when it steps back, it leaves a huge sucking sound. The challenge then is can these other countries, will they step in to take the leadership role? It's not, it's not such big dollars, mm. but what it does require is that, that global. It, it's 10 not, seconds, and it's 10 not, seconds. I would take it out of the political level and recognize that China, Africa, countries around the world have CDCs. Mm. That's the name of their public health institution. And there's a relationship that the US has with other countries that's below the political level, but that's on a trusted public health science level. And I think we need to preserve that hopefully fund it and sustain that. And it's great if China's mm -hmm. getting into real, real it. Real short, Tom. The technical expertise is essential, and it is wider and deeper, and I can say this unbiased now, at CDC than anywhere else in the world. And if the CDC isn't engaging, it means the quality of the work to, being done elsewhere, and CDC's ability to learn from other countries will be undermined. Thank you. I'm give you the last question. It has to be very brief. Epidemics of prediabetes, obesity, type 2 diabetes, what can it learn from successes in other epidemics? Well, uh, in the other aspect of Resolve to Save Lives, we're working to prevent, uh, help countries prevent 100 million deaths from heart disease and stroke through scale up of broad interventions that save many lives, like uh, standardized treatment of high blood pressure, currently only 14% of the world with high blood pressure has it controlled, or elimination of artificial trans fat of the world, the first elimination product project in the non-communicable disease space, right. parallel to smallpox or polio or uh, river blindness or filariasis. So there are real uh, analogies for the uh, non-communicable diseases from the communicable diseases, and plus there are some uh, crossovers like cancer liver cancer, cervical cancer, are infectious disease caused and can be prevented. So and I'm going to say on your website you have a big section related to cardiovascular and uh, so go to Resolve to Save Lives. Just as we close and just, just real, real fast because at the, the Atlantic we're uh, storytellers and I often ask when no matter what policy discussion we get together, I'm always interested in what villain would be in your story that uh -huh. you have to beat to, to move your needle forward. So just real quick, Ron, who's your villain in your story? Uh, it's not <laughs> who you think it is. No. no, no. I, I, look, I, I think the, the villain remains uh, complacency and apathy. I think that uh, when there's one of these global events, everyone gets fired up, everyone gets focused. When it goes away, the concern goes down. That's the big villain here, and that's the thing we all need to come together to try to overcome. And I'm going to say the viruses are my villain. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Seth? I would have said complacency, but the other I was toying with was nationalism because, mm -hmm. you know, we can talk all we want about nationalism. It is, a, you know, the, the horse is out of the barn. It is a global world, and we need to be thinking global, certainly um, on prevention. Uh, in addition to apathy, complacency, invisibility. The invisibility of what's happening today in communities around the world where lives are being lost from diseases that didn't have to spread. I want to thank all of you. I want to thank the audience. Thank Tom Friedman from Revolve to Save Lives, Seth Berkeley from Gavi, 
Anne Shukit of Centers for D Disease Control and Prevention and Ron Klein from Revolution and Abel Lazar. Thank you for adding that. So thank, thank you. you all very much.